I've heard of a land that is wondrously fair. They say that its splendor is far beyond compare. In that place that's called heaven, my soul longs to be. For where Jesus is, that will be heaven for me. If walls were and jasper, if streets were not gold, if mansions would crumble, if folks there grew old, still I'd see. makes it heaven for me. Heaven for me. Heaven for me. Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. All its beauty and wonders I'm longing to see, but Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. Amen. Thank you. I have video of that girl when she was very small. And uh, certainly good to see the Jarvises again. Turn with me this evening, if you would please, to Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. Ecclesiastes 8. I believe I'm on there. Yes, sir. I'll push this off to the side. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. But slave all good to be with you again, my friend. Appreciate you very much. God has really blessed this church. And uh, you've, great, you've got a wonderful pastor, such a special uh, man of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 tonight. I want to say right off the bat, I appreciate my Bible, and I hope you do too, when you look down and think about how many people never have a copy of the Word of God. I first uh, of 11 trips I ever got to take into old Mexico years ago with Brother Demarest down there in El Paso, I remember handing a John and Romans to an 82-year-old man for the first time ever cast his eyes upon a copy of the Word of God. And to watch him sit down and just look at it so differently and then begin to weep as he read it. And, and certainly I was weeping more than he was. It, may, it had an impact on me and I, I just never have forgotten that uh, to see it. Ecclesiastes 8, chapter, uh, 8, verse number 1. Who is as the wise man and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever, he, whatsoever pleaseth him. For the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? One of the great convictions that we have about getting the word of God into people's lives is because where the word of the king is, there is power. 
And if somebody has this eternal living book called the Bible, God has the ability to speak and to work and to change lives. And I want to speak to you about that tonight. For the word of a king is, there's power from verse 4. Let's pray. Father, it's been a busy day today. Thank you for letting us serve you today in different capacities in this church, in our lives. Thank you for our safety. The Lord, your business is at hand. The book is open. I merely want to be a mouthpiece just to preach the Word of God and be timely and say the right thing and stop at the right moment. You've been sure good to us, Lord, throughout the years, and I thank you so much for it. It's because of your Word and because of your Son and because of His blood, because of His righteousness and all that Christ is. Uh, tonight, remind us of this cherished book that we hold and thank you again for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Kings in Solomon's day, they had a vast amount of power. Uh, their word was the final word. Their will was, was always so. No one could veto it. If the king got angry, the Bible says that his wrath was as a roaring of a lion. The Bible says in Scripture that the king that sitteth in the throne of judgment, he could cast, scatter away all evil with his eyes. In other words, he was so powerful that he could actually move his eyes and his servants would know, do this or do that. But then you take the word of a king, when he spoke, it was the final authority. If he was mean, his countrymen, they were mere slaves. They had to do everything that he said. He had the final say-so. And By the way, I'll just parenthetically stop for a minute and say, I'm thankful I live in a country that one person doesn't have the final say-so about things. And... Uh, America may holler, we want uh, Hillary, and God says, no, I want Trump. <laughs> or the word of a king is, there, there's power. I mean, and I'm thankful for the democracy that we live in. But in the Bible days, we learned that uh, whatever the king says, it was absolute. And of course, our God is the king of all kings, and his word has all power and eternal authority behind it, and it will never change. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And tonight I appreciate the fact that in this old King James Bible, I believe that it is God's eternal, inspired, and I'll take it a step further, preserved word uh, for the English-speaking people. And uh, it, this word of this king that I hold and you hold tonight has so much power in it. I think our familiarity with it sometimes uh, lends, leads us to maybe not respect it as much as we used to and and maybe we're not as uh, moved by it as because we've heard about it so much and listened to it. But this word of a king in which I preach from tonight, it has the power to, I believe, excite our all. Now, I'm 59 years old, and I don't find too many times in life I'm uh, struck by many things that I stand back and I say, oh, wow, that's awesome. And there are some times that happens occasionally, but I tell you what, this Bible that I have here, it still has the power to excite our all. I mean, I can be in it sometimes and reading something, and I almost get like a kid. I'm like, wow, look at this. This is good. I saw something today in 2 Timothy about Paul uh, telling them to bring the, the parchments. And I thought, and God gave me a, a, I guess you could call a sermonette for Christianettes. And uh, I don't know, but anyway, I got fired up about it. Awed by the Word of God. You see, we're so small in God's sight. In fact, the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, it's he that sits upon the circle of the earth. And we are the inhabitants. We're like grasshoppers, you know. And uh, we think we're so tough and we're so powerful and mighty. In fact, I've always said we Baptists are the only people that can strut sitting down. And uh, we, we think that we really got it going on the bag of chips sometimes, don't we? That we really, uh, we talk so proudly of what we can do and what we can say and what we're going to get done. But buddy, I'm going to tell you why. When, when God is the king of all authority, he summons something to take place. We ought to realize we ought to be awed about it. The kings of the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament especially, we'll find, uh, death and life was clearly in the power of their tongue. I think about old Daniel. The Bible tells us that the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. There wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any uh, hung juries or any acquittals or anything of that nature. What the king says happened to Daniel. I think about old Shimei that cursed David in his life uh, after David was dead and gone. Solomon looked to Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and said of uh, Shimei, who got out of line, you go and fall upon him. And they went and took his life, and nobody said anything about it. 
I think about old Joab, the great military leader for Israel for years. The Bible teaches us that uh, he got out of line too and crossed the line of demarcation. And uh, Solomon said, the great king said to Jehoiada uh, Benaiah, the son, uh, son of Jehoiada again, go and fall upon him. And he did. And no one stopped him. If it was a Pharaoh and he ordered the killing of the babies, it would take place. If it was a Herod that ordered the killing of the babies, it would take place. If it was a David that would order Uriah to the forefront of the battle, he would be put at the forefront of the battle. If it was a John the Baptist, so somebody could say, bring me the head of the Baptist on a charger, and it would take place. Because as the king spake, it was done. In Solomon's day, Solomon could have said, bring me that baby and I'm going to cut it in half and nobody would have arrested him, nobody would have stopped him because where the word of a king is, there is clearly power. And whatever the king said, it got done. Now when I think about creation, we have the privilege to about every eight or nine weeks to go by, back to Florida and plug up and get rejuvenated and head out again. And in doing so, I'm awed by the oceans. I'm awed by the mountains as I travel and see uh, God's creation and the beauty of what He's done. But I want you to imagine tonight, before there was no days, when God said, let there be. And as Scripture says, it was so. God, with His Word, spake this creation into existence. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. When I think about His creation, I'm, I'm like, wow. I mean, and that's what the creation is meant to do, not for us to worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, but to recognize how powerful our God is when He spoke with what He did with His Word. I want to remind you here tonight that His Word has the power to create a new person. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want to remind you tonight that by the living Word of God, the Bible says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but by the, living, uh, the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God has given us a book that will change people's lives that will get people saved, that will alter what takes place in their lives. God can create new things with His Word that works in something's, somebody's life. It has the power to excite our all. Not only does He have the power to create things, but He also has the power to stop things, to cessate things as well. You see, God can say, I don't want that to happen, and it can happen. We find in the Bible, just as uh, uh, God commanded that the flood would flood the whole earth, and I do believe in a worldwide deluge, and it happened because God spake and wanted it to happen. Upon His command, fire and brimstone could fall upon cities like Sodom and Gomorrah and leave men in piles and a city in ashes because God says, I want it to stop. You see, God can order things to come alive. He can, he can make alive, and the Bible says He can also kill. And God with His Word has the power to do those things. Herein is how we can understand as we study the Bible that God knows the end from the beginning. I look at the Middle East sometimes and I think, how can it be that God Almighty has said that one day they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and this crazy Middle East as we see it in this crazy world, everybody's going to come and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something today. God Almighty with His Word has the power to stop this mess that this world is in today. And just as Daniel said it would happen as he prophesied, and just as John saw it on the Isle of Patmos as a great revelator, whatever God has said, amen and amen, it will be so, my friend, because His Word has the power to do it. For where the Word of a King is, there's power, power to excite our all. And maybe tonight you sit here, and there was once a day that you would open the Bible, and when you would read it, you would get excited about it. And tears would fill your eyes, and you were awed by it. Now you lightly throw it aside. Now you don't take time to read it. Now you don't see the importance of it in your life. Oh, my friend, never lose your awe for the Bible, because your Bible has the power to excite your awe. Think about what your Bible has done for you in your life. Where would you be without your Bible? If somebody took your Bible from you, where would you be, my Christian friend? You'd be in a mess tonight. 
Oh, we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord by the Word of God. As newborn babes, we desire the sin and milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. And maybe you see here tonight and you've lost your awe and you've lost your respect and you've lost your genuine humility when it's preached and when it's read and you, you forgot to look up to heaven and say, God, you're an awesome God. Thank you for this Word of a King that I have here tonight has the power to excite our all. I'll tell you something else it has the power to do. It has the power to encourage our obedience. It helps us. I don't know about you, but I don't always want to obey. I got a rebellious streak in me. And I thought as I'd get older, that rebellious streak would get narrower. <laughs> but it's gotten wider. And I tell you what, I, I feel myself so often prone to wonder. God, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But you know, whenever God commands for us to do something, His Word has the power to encourage our obedience. You see, God says give. And sometimes my spirit says, well, I don't want to give. And then God says, give, and it shall be given again unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For with the same measure that you meet, it shall be measured to you. And I think, oh, okay, then I'll give. God says, uh, I want you to bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. And sometimes my spirit may say, well, I don't want to do that. God says, oh, but bring you all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, which you will not be able to receive. And I say, well, bless God, I think I'll do that. That gives me the power. It encourages my obedience. Some people see the Word of God as not being paramount in their life to do what God has told them to do. Sometimes we will run it by our reasoning or our, or our, our convenience or, or, or what uh, we're going to get out of it. But friend, if God tells you to do something, the bottom line is to do it. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Some see, people see the Word of God as not a, 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 a thing for uh, faith and practice. They see it as, uh, I've got to get something out of it. You may say here tonight, Brother, Brother Smith, I, I tell you, I don't know what's the best course of action for me to take right now in my life. I'll say like Solomon said in verse 2, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. You say to me, well, it'll cost me some friends. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. You say, it may cost me financially or my peers may not like it. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. If God has told you to do something, then friend, don't try to figure it out. Just obey God. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And faith is not a, a hard object to practice, friend. It's the decision to take the faith and to say, I'm going to just do what God has told me to do. You see, the Word of the King has the power to encourage me to obey God. And if I'll obey God, the best will come out of it. God has sworn by His oath, according to verse 2, I will bless thee and I'll bless you if you'll do what I tell you to do. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, then you will, you'll find some trouble out of it. The Bible says if you refuse and, 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 and don't obey, you'll be devoured with the sword. But if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You see, God says, just do what I tell you to do. The Bible said in verse 3 that Solomon said, be not hasty to go out of his sight. And sometimes God tells us to do something and we say, well, maybe if I fall out of church, I don't have to do this. And maybe if I get around the, not around the brethren, I don't have to do it. I, I'll just run over here and get out of the, out of the way and God won't see me. Be not hasty to go out of His sight. Because whither shall you flee from His Spirit? If you ascend up into heaven, He is there. If you make your bed in hell, He is there. If you take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, God's going to be there. You're not going to get out of the sight of God. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil. And the good. You may say, well, I'll, I'll do this and I'll not obey him and I'll get out of his sight. Nobody will know. Listen to me. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing. That's what verse 3 says. Sometimes we say, yeah, but I'm, gonna, I, I'm wrestling with God about this matter. Let me tell you something. Nobody's ever won a wrestling match with God. God always wins. God will always come out to be on top. Stand not in an evil thing. Does not God have power to reach you wherever you run to? 
Does not that power, God have power to understand what all is going on in your life for every moment of your life? Has it ever dawned on you that nothing ever dawned upon God? And that all decisions have to run across His desk for approval? And something sometimes happens in our life and we become disobedient to God and we don't want to do what God has told us to do. I want to remind you here tonight that God's Word has the ability to encourage me just obey God. And when I simply think in my spirit, if I'll just do what God tells me to do, then all these things are going to fall into place. It's going to be all right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You say, where do you get that encouraging word? I get it from my Bible. My Bible has the power, the word of a king, to encourage my obedience. But there's something else that the word of the king has the power to do, and that's the power to ensure my confidence. Now, I won't always be upbeat and positive. But you're looking at Mr. Pessimism. I'm usually, that's usually the first road that I'll go down. Sometimes I don't find myself being too confident. You can go and stare at me if you want, but I know you're the same way. You see, the Word of God has the power to ensure me confidence. There's sometimes I need mercy. And I don't have the confidence that God will be merciful to me. Maybe you sit here tonight and mercy is what you genuinely need to be seeking in your life and you think that, that God won't give it to you. Well, listen to His Word. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call upon His name while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and He will abundantly pardon and He goes on to say that He shall have mercy. Oh, let me tell you something, that the mercies of the Lord, uh, they endure forever. Can I remind you today that the mercies of the Lord are renewed every morning? <laughs> Boy, I've exhausted God's mercies throughout the year, and I, I find myself sometimes thinking, oh boy, I, f I fumbled on third and ten, and, and man, I, I, I did that, and, it, and I, man, I have sinned, and God, I need your mercy. And, and maybe you sit here tonight and you say, but I've done something that's too embarrassing for me to mention. I, I've done something that I, I, I just don't know if God will be merciful to me for that one. There's other things I know He has been, but not for that one. Can I say to you tonight, you fall at His feet, and you pray for mercy. And I want to remind you, He says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ah, my Bible says in red letter version in the, in the Gospels, it says, He that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast him out. Man, I love that verse. Sometimes I get to thinking, I get this old condemnation on me, and I know I've sinned, and I think, well, God won't forgive me. But I, then all of a sudden I realize, wait a minute, God said that He would forgive me, and God would be merciful to me. And friend, when I come to God, it's not that He's saying, you get out of here and you fix this later. God is always loving and merciful to me anytime I come to Him. And I'll tell you what, the Word of God ensures me to have that confidence that that mercy of God will always be there when I need it. You need mercy to not fall before Him at this altar call in just a minute and say, God, be merciful to me. Don't give me what I deserve, please, God. I beg you, have mercy, God. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find the mercies of the Lord. I promise you. Maybe tonight you just don't need mercy, but maybe the truth of the matter is your confidence level is low because you need mending. You see, if the sparrow falls to the ground, he sees it and he's aware of it. And maybe you sit here tonight and you're struggling with some kind of hurt. This world and its happenings has chewed you up and spit you out and the devil's left you for dead. Maybe somebody here tonight has stabbed you. Maybe they've lied upon you. Let me tell you something. You stick around this thing long enough, it's going to happen to you. You're going to get wounded. And you're going to get bruised. And you're going to get hurt in a way that you never imagined. I'm going to tell you something, the devil has got some big torpedoes and you've got a target on your back as a child of God. And I quietly and simply state these truths here tonight because I know the Word of God has the power to ensure my confidence that if I need mending, God has a way of mending my broken heart. I don't like it when people lie on me. I don't like it when somebody says this. I don't like it when somebody does something. But you know what? And my heart is bleeding and hurting and bruised. Guess what? God has a way of mending that. With His Word, He has a way of fixing that. 
But maybe it's a little bit more of a hush-hush thing because maybe it goes back to days in your family that maybe it was incest or maybe there was a rape or maybe there was a, a divorce and, and maybe it's that situation that like the old Spanish proverb says, every home has its hush and if one of the kids brings up that subject, you say, shh, don't, don't, don't mention that. Let's don't talk about that. The truth of the matter is you're, you're doing well on some cylinders of your life, but over here, this thing has just got you messed up. And this thing has got, uh, you're, you're just inside, you're hurt. And you want to say, but, but preacher, if, if I could just tell you what, what that guy did to me, God knows what he did to you. If you knew how my heart bleeds and how, how I hurt, she ran off and left me and, and left me with this and, 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 and I'm, I'm really hurt over this. And truth of the matter is I'm really dealing with some bitterness over this and I don't know how more I can, I, I've, I've jumped some big hurdles in my life but, but this is a big one. This one's weighing me down. You, you think God could help me with it? Let me tell you something. If you need mending tonight, I'm here to tell you on the authority of the Word of God, the Holy Ghost of Jesus Christ has a way about wrapping His love in arms around you and say, I love you with an everlasting love nothing shall ever be able to separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus and he's able to just encourage you once again to say bless God I can get up and I can run another mile bless God I can get up and I can face another day hallelujah because of the word of God I now have the confidence to be strong and in the Lord and in the power of his might you see it has a power to encourage my confidence that's why the Bible needs to be put in everybody's hands that's why the world needs this word of God of which we preach tonight, the word of faith. Maybe tonight it's the fact that you need motivation. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the harder it is to motivate me. Man, I tell you, I get motivated by buffet bars and uh, coffee and caffeine and ding-dongs and Big Macs. But some mornings I get up and my bed is Velcroed to my back. And the last thing I want to do is read my Bible and pray. And the last thing I feel motivated to do is get up and just do right. I'm not talking about do something, but do right. And before I get out of the house, I've done kicked the dog and got in an argument with the wife. And I don't have a dog, but anyway, if I did, I'd probably kill him. But uh, anyway, and, uh, something just, I'm just not motivated. Well, listen to the Word of God. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, my sins weighted me down. God's faithful, and He's just to forgive you of your sins. You say, but I'm, I just don't have the sufficiency to go on. His grace is sufficient for you. I'm overcome tonight, preacher. Hey, I, can I remind you that greater is He that's in you than He that's in this world? Uh, something's conquering me. Wait a minute. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Hallelujah. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You say, but my conscience is really bothering me. Let me tell you something. His blood is able to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God. God's able to get you through what you're going through. Maybe the devil and the brethren and circumstances and money and people and things have convinced you that you're done for. And you've lost your motivation. And your heart is broken and you need mending. And you find yourself here tonight thinking that even God Himself would not be merciful to you. Oh, I'm here to tell you tonight on the authority of this great book. God has promised that He will come through for you in the time of your need. God will always be there with you. He will always, as Spurgeon said, take the bleakest side of the battle. He'll always hide you under the shelter of His arms. His banner over you is love. God loves you greatly. You may have told you that today. Jesus loves you. You see, His Word, the Word of a King, has the power to ensure my confidence to say, well, hey, they may not like me and nobody may not believe in me, but God believes in me and God's invested in me and I'm covered in the blood and I'm saved and sanctified, I'm sealed and God is, God's with me and God will never fail me. You know what? If I'm in this thing all by myself, hallelujah, I, I can go on. You see, has the power to encourage me with a confidence that I'm going to be all right. And friend, I want you to know something. As a Christian, you're going to be all right. God cares for you deeply. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Have faith in God and trust what He says and watch God come through. 
That's the way our God works. You see, it has the power to encourage our confidence. There's something else the word of the king has the power to do. The power to enable my efforts. Because here's the bottom line. Sometimes I don't want to obey. And then I hear his word and I try to obey. And then sometimes I'm not too confident that I'm going to be all right, but I just go on and do it anyway. But other times I say, I'm going to do that. I heard that message, and I'm going to go to the altar, and I'm going to commit to the Lord, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to put all of my efforts into making this happen. And then I get up, and I start trying to do, and put my own muscle and energy behind it, and I soon find that I don't have the power to enable my efforts to get it done. Because come Monday, I'm not nothing like I was on Sunday during church. And the next week, my efforts are not as diligent as I meant for them to be. On What's happened? You see, the Word of God has the power to enable my efforts in my personal life. Where the Word of the King is, can I say to you, there's power. You say to me tonight, I'm defeated. Then you've gotten away from the Word of God. Because where the Word of the King is, there's power in your personal life. A young man says, well, I... I can't quit doing this. This has just got a hold of me. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. I feel like, preacher, I'm in darkness uh, uh, as a person. The entrance of his word giveth light. I feel dirty, preacher. Thy words, he says, will make you clean. John 15, 3. You see, God has a way of taking His Word and working in our life. You, sometimes as a believer, I thought, well, what I need right now is if I had some more men to help me out, and if I had some more money, and if I had some more people behind me, but my need is not money, and it's not people, and it's not things, and it's not stuff, though they can be helpful at times. What I need is more power. For we're the Word of the King, and there's power in my personal life. Power to get the job done. And tonight, I'm going to tell you something. As much as you pull away from this Bible, you're going to find your power diminished as a Christian in your life. And what you do with this Bible is going to determine what God is going to do with you. And the role that this book plays inside of your life, because it's so powerful, it will give you the power and the victory in your personal life to overcome. Not just in my personal life, but power in our pulpits. You know... As a preacher, I watched over the years a lot of men, and thank God your pastor's not that way, hallelujah, but I've I've watched a lot of men that's gotten away from just sticking with preaching the old book. The way way this church has been blessed throughout the years is in this pulpit, the word of the king has always been proclaimed, you see. In our pulpits, and by the way, I believe in old-fashioned preaching. And and, and I had a family member recently to contact me and said, listen, I've been listening to you online. If you would just kind of tone it down a little bit, you might get more people to like you preach. You see, preaching is guttural. It comes from inside of you. It says it should have some, some passion with it. God's chosen the foolish as a preacher to save them that will believe. You might want somebody to be soft-soaked and milk-toast and, and easy all the time, but what, what God wants is His Word to be preached. He told, he told Ezekiel, He said, Smite with the hand, stamp with the foot. He told Isaiah, Make some noise, cry loud, spare not. Hey, hey, let some people know that you're awake. Let some people know that you believe what you're saying. You may not believe what I'm saying, but you dead sure going to know I believe it. <laughs> there ought to be some passion in preaching. Billy Sunday used to say, if we had more preaching on hell in our pulpits, we'd have less of it in the streets. The way our country got great was when we had these, uh, these pulpits lit up with the fire of preaching in our country, and the Word of God was preached without, without uh, uh, backing up, preached with conviction. And may I say, preach with a love, a spirit of love and kindness at the same time. You see, if I stand here and tell you you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved, and I look at you as I'm preaching it like I'm glad and hope you do go to hell, then it's not a good preaching. But if I preach to you with pathos in my heart and conviction inside of me that I want you to turn to Christ and I want you to do right and I want you to trust, and then you know from that pulpit there's something powerful coming. You see, the word of a king, it speaks like that. There's nothing like when the preacher preaches and you feel like he's been reading your mail. There's been times I've been sitting in the pew and I said to my wife, did you tell somebody? Or she punched me and said, I hope you're listening to this. And I said, you better be listening to this. Because the bottom line is the preacher just is like he had been sitting on, in my, on my couch and knew what was going on in my life. 
But when that kind of preaching is done, where the word of a king is, there's power, we go home and we say, can you believe he preached on that? That spoke to my heart. That was exactly what I needed. You know what it is? It's the word of a king. Years ago, a physician uh, ridiculed Moody and uh, had heard that he was coming to England where his practice was at, and he told his workers, he said, um, I'm going to go hear Moody, and I'm going I'm to cut apart everything that he says, and I'll come back tomorrow and tell you just how terrible of a preacher he was. And he went to hear Moody preach, and that night he got under conviction, and he came forward during the invitation, and he was saved. <laughs> Next day, he went back to his practice, and... <laughs> The physician was asked by his other co-workers, I thought you went to pick apart Moody and you're telling us you got converted? He said, all I know is I sat there and Moody fired one shot right after another from that, behind that pulpit. It was like he was shooting bullets right at me. And all I know, the power of Moody was on the tip of his tongue when he spoke the Word of God. And friend, I'm going to tell you what, that's what we need more of where the word of a king is. There's power in our pulpits, our personal life. And I'll close with this last one. And I've got to say it humbly in our prayer life. I don't know about you, but I hear somebody even talk about prayer. And I get convicted because I'm not the man of prayer that I ought to be. Is anybody in this room a man of prayer that you ought to be? Or a woman of prayer? I, I have a feeling you're not. But I'm like anybody else. I want my prayers answered. Amen. And the Bible says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You have not, because you ask not. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For he that asketh, Findeth he, or, or asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. He that knocketh, the door shall be opened unto him. God says, I am the Lord God that brought you out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. Just tell him what you got on your heart. And I'll fill it. You see, if his word's abiding in you, and you're trying to do what he wants you to do, the word of a king can get your prayers answered. Years ago, I would take my daughters out, and we'd go to Walmart or something, and my daughters got a hold of this. My bareheaded boys, they didn't have enough sense to pick up on it. But I told my daughters and my boys, I said, whoever hangs out with daddy when he's going places will always get special treatment. And my girls would always jump on board and go to Walmart or go to the mall or something. We'd get there and all of a sudden they'd say, Daddy, are you a liar? And I'd say, no, I'm not. Why? And they said, well, you told us that whoever went with you got special treatment. We want a dress. <laughs> and guess what they often got? They got a dress. They knew how to milk me for what I had because they always held up in front of me my word. No man wants somebody to tell him that his word is not any good. And friend, when you know what God's word is in your prayer life, you can get your prayers answered. When we first started this journey last year, a few hurdles came along. And, you know, when you go from a, you've got an income to suddenly you don't, you're trying to raise support and get on the road. I must confess, there's a lot of questions you have and a lot of things that brings you back to square one as a Christian again to say, do I really believe God is the God that I've always told everybody that he is and he'll always do what he said he would do? And when I begin to book our meetings in, in our motor home and for travel, we, live, we were living at that time in Milton, Florida, which is about 25 to 30 miles from the Alabama state line. And like a genius, I was an idiot, it's what I was, I booked our first meeting in Fort Pierce, Florida. Fort Pierce, Florida is about an hour and a half north of Miami. And uh, I had limited amount of funds, and the motorhome we got gets about seven miles to a gallon of diesel. You try that one on. That's fun. <laughs> and we got ready to go, and I told Didi, I said, Honey, we need to pray that nothing happens because I've got just enough to get to the Riverview Baptist Church in uh, Fort Pierce, Florida. If nothing happens... We started out across Panhandle, Florida. That's a big panhandle. And we turned and we headed south down the heart of the state. It's, uh, it's uh, Interstate 75. And uh, I had called ahead and got a place that we could plug up our motor home and uh, paid $10 for it. You see, you just don't plug, uh, plug up those things on a Burger King parking lot. They're pretty big. And, you know, you got your car and everything. And so... We made that first place. The guy comes out at closing time and says, Hey, preacher, I'm sorry. I didn't think he was going to come. I went on and rented your place out. And I said, Man, why? You know, and uh, he said, Well, I'm sorry. And 
I had to drive about an hour and a half to find a place to plug it up. To, to, I didn't have sense enough to do what they call boondocking it yet. and So I used about half a tank of diesel. I didn't have the money. I said, oh, my goodness. I got up the next morning. I told Dee, I said, honey, we got to pray because just the little bit of funds we've got left, we're not going to make it if, so, if something don't happen. Uh, but we're going to just go by faith. We pulled out on the interstate, and as soon as we did, there had been a car wreck way on down the road. Some people had been killed, and cars caught on fire. And, and, and listen to me, I'm not preaching now, I'm telling you the truth, all right? <laughs> and uh, we were in the middle of the interstate, and we sat there for three and a half hours. And it was hot. This was deep December. Now, you imagine that December hot. We're in Florida. So I pulled the air brakes, and we just sat there with it running, and I watched another half tank of diesel go out of it. And by that time, I'm like, oh, my soul, what are we going to do? Oh, my goodness. And Dee says, well, you want to call our pastor? I said, babe, this is our first trip out. I'm not going to do that. I said, we just got just to believe God to work this out. We don't have enough money to make it. We're just sitting there in the interstate. Cars, big giant parking lot, as far as the eye can see, front and back. People stop. Dee said, what are we going to do? I said, babe, you remember when we first got saved years ago when we got into Bible college, how we had to pray for God to give us a hot dog? I had to pray to get our shoes resold, or just I said maybe we've forgotten those things in our prayer life. I said let's pray. Right there in the middle of the interstate, bowed our heads. And I remember kind of, I had kind of a broken heart, and I said, Lord, I know you're in this. I'm trying to do right, and I should be taking better care of my wife than I am now. But I ain't got the money, God. I don't want to call my pastor. And we're right here in the middle of this interstate, and we're not going to make it to our first meeting. God, what's going on? I said, God, I don't know anybody in this state, but I'm asking you to give me $100. That's all I need, God. It'll get me there. He said, amen. 30 minutes went by. Nothing happened. All of a sudden, my wife said, there's a lady beside us, and she's crying, and she's waving at me, and uh, she's trying to get my attention. And I'm thinking, oh, good night. I may have bumped her, or what's happened? And I look, and there's this lady. She's driving a Lexus. She's got diamonds on her fingers, and, man, she's crying, waving at us. I'm thinking, oh, why is a lady like this trying to stop gypsies like us running up down the highway? It's not normal, you know. I'm thinking, my wife said, what do I do? I said, well, let's open the door and see what she wants. And my wife opened the door, and she goes, if you'll let me use your bathroom, I'll give you $100. I said, well, good night, get around, come in here. And she was already parked on the interstate. She jumped up in, I stuck my hand out, she bolted by me, ran back to the bathroom back there, slammed the door, and I'm thinking, oh my word, man, what's going on? My wife goes, there's $100 we just asked God to give us. I said, sure is, isn't it? And I thought, no, I can't do that to her. You know, we've all been in that predicament. You know, man, when you got to go, you've got to go, brother, I'm telling you. And so I think, I can't take her money. A couple of minutes later, she comes out of the bathroom. She says, oh, I just, I'm going for an ultrasound. They've had me drinking all this stuff. I'm pregnant. She says, uh, she says here's $100. I was just praying. If God, I don't want to get out in front of everybody and use the bathroom on this interstate, but if you'll give me a bathroom, I'll give whoever it is $100. Here it is. I said, man, we can't take you $100. Huh? I'm sorry, God bless you. We appreciate it, but we're, here's what we're doing. Gave her one of our cards, and she said, well, I'm an independent Baptist. I'm a, member, I'm a member of the Fellowship Baptist Church in Lake City, Florida, and she said, I'll pray for you. I said, well, God bless you. Do that. She gets out, gets her card. She's so happy, and she shuts the door, and my wife goes, there went our $100. I said, I know it. I know it. I, maybe I should have took it, but I just we couldn't do it. But you know what the Lord showed me? The Lord showed me, Brother Slayball, if he wants to get me $100, he can call somebody to have to use the bathroom to get me $100. And do it in the middle of the interstate. Now, friends, I'm not making this up. This is too crazy to make up. This, I'm, I'm telling you the truth now. This is what happened. Well, we started on down the road. A couple years back, I got my, my account hacked. And somebody got all my money. If anybody ever does you that way, they'll mess you up. <laughs> and uh, I've got a banking app on my thing, so every day I open that banking app to remind me that I'm broke and I don't have any money. <laughs> but I open it up to look and see, you know, if anybody's done it again. And uh, that morning I had done it. There was nothing in my bank account. I wasn't about to call my pastor our first trip out. And I called on God, and he reminded me he could do anything. But I still didn't have it. And I was about empty on diesel. And how in the world am I going to make it on down to Fort Pierce, Florida? And... Uh, so I did, he said, what are we going to do? I said, let's put the last we got in, and we did. Still wasn't going to be enough. We are going on down the road, and all of a sudden, after about an hour and a half, I think, well, it just habit. And I opened it up, and I looked. 
And somebody had put $1,000 into my account. Did y'all hear me? $1,000. I called my home church. I said, what's going on? Somebody put $1,000 in my account. They said, well, we don't know anything about it. All we know is two days ago somebody called, asked how to put money in your account. Evidently they did. And I said, glory to God. I pulled that big giant thing off. I filled it up with diesel gas. And I went straight to Applebee's. And I got me a rack of ribs. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, got to keep up the physique. Amen. And, uh, <laughs> woo! <laughs> I love ribs. But uh, anyway, we limped on down to Fort Pierce, Florida. Mark Leonard down there, the pastor, they fed, our, fed us really good for two or three days, took us on for support, came back up to Eustis, Florida. Mike Watkins at the Lighthouse Baptist Church, they took us on for support. Man, we just floated back home that next week. So excited. Boy, there's a big God in this world, isn't it? And He's our God, and He loves us, and He's for what we're doing. And I went to the mailbox, and there was a card. And it was from the Friendship Baptist Church, or Fellowship, I can't remember which it was, in Lake City, Florida. And I opened it up, and over 93 people had signed a card thanking us for letting one of their choice members use the bathroom in, in, in the middle of Interstate 75 that day on the highway. I was like, wow, this is awesome. But there was another card under there. It was from Carrie Kunai and her husband, the lady that we had helped. And she was thanking us for being in the way when she had a need in her life. And she says, what a testimony it's been to be able to tell people about me being able to use the bathroom in the middle of I-75 by getting my prayers answered. And she said, and I knew you wouldn't take it, so here's your $100. And she put $100 in the card. Now I say all that to say this, because sometimes we think that we're second rate. And that God don't care about us like He does somebody else. And maybe He just don't have time to hear us when we pray. And maybe His Word just don't fit us in our circumstance. And what I'm being reminded of, as I was then, it ain't about me. It never has been. You know what it's about? It's about that book right there. And you show me a people, or a person, or a church, or anybody that will involve themselves in investing on getting that book into the hands of other people, and I'll show you a people that God smiles upon their life, blesses, and walks with them in their journey. That's the kind of God I've got. That's the kind of God you've got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of a king. Thank you that we have a Bible. Why should I have a Bible and other people never have a copy of it? In fact, I have it on my phone. I have several copies in our motor home. I have several copies back in Fort Walton. I, I have more than I could ever read. And to whom much is given, much is required. And I as a Christian ought not to just read my Bible and love it and cherish it and raise my children by it and try to live by it and try to do what it tells me to do and love you in the process of it. But I feel like we all have a duty to commit these things also and to pass the book on to the next generation. Jesus, you're coming soon. I do believe it. And until you come, we've got to be occupied and being faithful. Speak to hearts tonight about this word that might be being neglected in somebody's heart and life or maybe in their family. One and how it is the devil's getting in like he is. Maybe they've taken the word of a king out of their home or out of their life. And God, where it is, there will be power, and there will be authority, and there will be victory. Thank you again. We don't deserve it. You're a great king. Thank you for speaking to us through the Holy Writ. Bless what's been said tonight and give Pastor wisdom with his people. And I appreciate you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen, Pastor.